Hello. So as it's VE Day, I've had a look through the recipes uh, that I will share with you. And one of the recipes I've selected is a cottage pie. It's a really good winter warmer. So if it's a little bit of a cold day, it's lovely to have a cottage pie. It uses up some things from the fridge, which is great because in, during wartime and certainly after the war, certain foods were in short supply. So a cottage pie was great for using up bits and bobs that you had left over. And also it's always a family favorite. So I hope you join me in making a cottage pie. I'm going to go through, as I always do, how to make a cottage pie, how I make a cottage pie. I'll give you some hints and tips along the way. I hope you enjoy cooking this and we'll get started. So let's see what you're going to need. So first of all, uh, you will need a ration book so that you can go and get some meat from your local butcher or supermarket. You will need your uh, jug so that you can make up some stock cube, salt and pepper, and Worcester sauce if you have it, some carrots, a stock cube as I say, so you'll need some hot water as well. Um, some herbs, so rosemary and thyme would be very good. So this has rosemary, thyme and uh, oregano in it as well. So that would be very good if you have any of that. So herbs of Provence. Um, some potatoes for the topping, a onion and some implements for cutting and skinning. And last of all, you will need some meat. Now you might think this is a bit unusual, if I just push this back, a little bit unusual that I've got my meat wrapped up like this. Let's have a look. Oh, lovely. So this is how you would have bought your meat uh, when this recipe was produced. You wouldn't have bought it in a plastic container like you do today. So it's much more basic, the packaging. So we're used to something called MAP packaging which is modified atmospheric pressure. So it comes in a sealed container and it keeps for a lot longer. Whereas they didn't have that during the war and certainly after the war. So this is how your meat would have been given to you at home. So this is what I've done. Try and keep it authentic. So put that to one side, so that'll be used for later. So I'm going to clear a space and we will start by chopping our onion. Right then, so to chop your onion, you want to look for the tufty bit and you want to try and keep that if possible. So the first thing I do is I just hold on to my onion this way and I just slice straight down to remove the little pointy bit like that. Then I have somewhere that I can put it down this way and I can cut it straight down. So you always cut onto the chopping board, never towards yourself or towards anyone else. So there we go. Remove the outside skin. So I can do this quite quickly, there we go. You don't want any of this papery, crunchy skin. Push it to one side, don't want any of that. Now you can lay it flat, and what you can do is this. You can use your knife and just go towards the tuft, slicing like this with your sharp knife. Now you want to watch out for your fingers, so remember your claw grip so your fingers are nice and safe. Watch your thumb, because it always sticks out further, so it's easy to cut your thumb, so do that. You can then go like this. So always moving your hand out of the way. So what I've done is I've made it into sort of like fingers or like a comb. And then what I'll do is I'm going to hold the onion together. I put the knife on the board and pull it towards me like this. And what that will do is it will dice the onion. So I can keep doing that all the way until the end and I'll have some nice small pieces. Another way you could do it, and it's a little bit lazier, but you can chop off the tufty bit and you can just cut this in half. And if you have one of these, pop it in there and you can whiz it so you end up with nice small diced pieces. So I'm going to do that now and I'll show you the next step in a moment. So cut your onions and join me back here in a second once you've done that. Brilliant. Right, my little gadget here has chopped the onion, so that's perfect. That is possible by hand, but it takes a lot less time using one of those. So if you have a little chopper, I'd recommend using that. It's brilliant. Right, so next one, uh, you'll need some water. So I have a big pan here with some hot water in it. That's ready for my potatoes to go into. So we'll put that to one side. And a lot of people ask me, how do you figure out how many potatoes you need? Well, it's quite simple. Pop your potatoes in the dish that you're planning on using. 
If you can cover the dish like this, then you have plenty. It's surprising how many potatoes you need. So I would do that just to get your quantity correct. And then your next mission or task is to peel a potato. So it's quite straightforward, really. Just mind your finger holding the potato. So peel away from you, just like that. Hold on to it and peel straight onto the board and just move the potato around like this. Some peelers are easier than others. This one is a fixed one, but sometimes you can get ones that have a, a blade that moves. So I'll just do this, bud, quickly. I'm quite a speedy peeler, really. So as you do this, just mind your finger, that's all. It's easy to catch this finger underneath. So, and it, they are very slippy. So, watch out for the peelings. There we go, lovely. Got rid of those. Now what I would do, it doesn't matter what size you chop this to. If it's smaller, it will, chop, it will boil faster. So make your potatoes about the same size. If you chop one you know, into a tiny piece like this and you have a big piece, this one will cook a lot faster so that it will cook unevenly. What will happen is this one will fall apart in the hot water and this one will end up being undercooked. So my advice is whatever size you make them, try and make them all about the same size. I wouldn't go much smaller than a golf ball. If you make them too small, they tend to fall apart a bit quickly. So that's what I would do. Try and chop them up into even sizes and about the size of a golf ball. That needs to go into some hot water now and be boiled for about 15 minutes until they're nice and soft, but they're not falling apart. And then the next maneuver is to mash it into your topping. So I'm going to pop that onto the hob now and peel the rest of these potatoes and then I'll show you the results in a moment. So my potatoes are now bubbling in a nice big pan of hot water on the, uh, on the hob there. So here are some carrots freshly dug up from the ground. You will need to take the top off if you have this part, so this just needs to be sliced away, and the same, you can take the tip off, but the rest is fine. Now, you could just wash this and chop it up, that would be okay, but if you want to peel it, you are more than welcome, but it is possible, you don't have to peel it. As long as you are happy that you've cleaned it, you can eat it with a little bit of the skin on, and it won't actually matter too much. Right then, so take your carrot, and it's up to you how you do it. You can chop it into pieces like this, so it's about the uh, thickness of a sort of two pound coin. Uh, if you want to, you can slice it this way as well. I quite like doing this. And then you end up having little edges like that, with a little chamfer. So I think that looks quite nice when you're cooking it. If you have a particularly large carrot that is quite big, you might find that you need to chop it in half, like that, or even quarter it, it's up to you. It really is, you're, at the end of the day, you're going to be eating this and you're the chef, so you decide how you'd like it. Carrots can be a little bit hard, so it is quite a good idea to chop it up into smaller pieces. You'll find it cooks a bit faster and it's softer as well when you come to eating it. I should have said, when you put your potatoes in, if you have any parsnips or swede, you're more than welcome to put parsnips and swede into your mash as well so you can make lots of different flavours for your potato mash it doesn't have to be just potato that's the beauty of a cottage pie you can change it to anything you like right so that's our carrot chops i'll probably cut up another one of these i think and add that shortly so we'll come back in a moment and i will actually start to cook the meat the onion and put our stock in so I'll join me in a moment when you've chopped up your Carrot, you're ready to start cooking. Okay, uh, I have a pan here. You need, well, it's up to you what you use, but I prefer using a deep uh, sort of frying pan. And it's perfect if you have a, a glass lid for it as well. That works very well. So the next thing to mention is that my potatoes are bubbling away there. So they are doing well. They've been in there for five minutes. So, what you'll need to do now is sweat your onion. So I've got some, whoops, I've got some olive oil here, but you could equally use uh, vegetable oil, that's fine. And take your onion, I've got a gas pop here, there we go. Turn the gas on, that's heating up now. 
pop your onion in and you'll need to sweat it for about four to five minutes. You don't want it to burn, you just want to soften it. So I'm just using this to scrape out all of my onion. I didn't have a brown onion, but you're welcome to use any sort of onion that you happen to have at home. Again, this is the, the beauty of this, and during you know harder times, they would have used anything they could they could find really. Onions grow quite well in this country, so most people would have grown some onions at home and things like that. So move it around, coat it with the oil. You don't want the heat on too high, so you want a low heat. And I put in a little splash of water, so about a tablespoon. There we go. And that's just to create some steam. So I'm just going to, there we go. And I pop the lid on, and then that is going to sit there for a couple of minutes. I'll open the lid, I'll give it a stir, and then give it a couple more minutes. And the idea is you're sweating the onions, so you're trying to make them translucent and soft. You don't want to burn them. Yes, you're cooking them, but you don't want them going brown and caramelizing very much at all. It's very easy to burn these, so low heat, you can, should hear them steaming away, sizzling like that, and that's perfect. They're just gonna sit there like they're in a little sauna just for about five minutes. Okay, once I've done that, I will show you the next stage. Right, this is uh, sweated nicely. It's just starting to stick to the pan, so it's getting a little bit sticky. It's caramelized a tiny bit, and it's becoming translucent. But I can see it's getting nice and soft, so that's perfect, that's just what I want. So, now I'm going to put in the, the meat here. So, just pick that up by the pan. There we go, get rid of this. So, this needs to brown now, so break up your meat a little bit, and there we go. So just let it seal itself a little bit, just wait a minute, and then move it around until the meat has become brown, and then you'll be ready for the next stage. So rather than you watching me, brown this meat. We'll pause it there and I'll come back when this is browned and I'll show you the next ingredients. If you haven't got them out already, this is where you're going to need the herbs. You'll need, if you have it, some Worcester sauce and you'll need to mix up some stock. So if you have a, a helper at home, they can make the gravy for you, the stock to go in there. If you don't have anyone, perhaps turn this down a little bit and make your stock now while this is on a low heat. My potatoes have nearly finished, by the way. They're just sitting there, ready to be drained. If you have a big pan like this, you might need some help. And that's ready for turning into mashed potato for the topping. So, we're doing well. I'll see you back in a few moments. Okay, now you might have noticed in the recipe it asked for garden weeds at this time. If you don't have any garden weeds that you fancy putting into your cottage pie, you're more than welcome not to. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that I'm not putting garden weeds into mine. Um, but if times were tight and you didn't have any parsley or anything like that, then garden weeds it is. Um, so if you have any fresh parsley at home, brilliant. If you have any dried herbs, you can pop those in. Thyme works very well for this. If you have the Worcester sauce, now is the right time. Here are a couple of optional extras for you. I generally uh, put in some tomato puree. Not a lot, a couple of tablespoons will be plenty for this and I find it gives it a nice, nice flavour. Some people put in um, a little spoon of uh, sugar to sweeten it a little bit. It won't make it sweet like a cake or anything like that, but it just helps to bring out the flavour a little bit. Some people put baked beans in as well. So you've got tomato sauce in there, so that will give it a slightly tomatoey flavour. And the beans actually up the protein, protein content, which is very good. So it's a good way of getting more protein without eating more meat. If you have corn at home, you can do half and half, so you can add corn to this, and then you up the protein content, but you lower the saturated fat. So by doing half meat and half corn is actually another really good way of getting more protein into your diet without all that, that saturated fat that you have for the, for the meat. So there's some options for you. Um, and the last thing that you will need, as I mentioned before, is some stock. So in here, we have some OXO stock cubes. Oops, that's a little bit hot there 
and I've also put in a bit of gravy just to thicken it slightly. You don't want to go mad with the gravy, but you want enough that it's not too dry. So that's about right, I would say. You can add more if you want to. I'm going to keep this on the side and I'll add some more in a moment if I think it's getting a little bit too thick. So, pop some herbs in there as well. There we go. And some Worcester sauce. Lovely, could drizzle the bat. You're the chef, so you decide how much uh, people are going to, to want. And it's up to you, but I normally pop in some tomato puree as well. So that about that much, so that's plenty. I'll give this a little stir. And last of all, I pop in my carrots that I've chopped. I've gone for a variety, some I've left whole, and some I've sort of turned into little shards as well, so it's nice to have a bit of a mixture. So some will be a little bit harder than others, but then you get a nice variety of texture when you're eating it. That's also another reason why I quite like putting the beans in, because they're a really nice, soft, sort of creamy texture when you eat, eat your cottage pie. You might think I'm going on a bit about the beans now, but if you haven't done it, it's really good. Um, that's now going to simmer for another 15 to 20 minutes just to soften the carrots before we put it all together. So that's going to sit there for a little while. I'll add a bit more gravy. And in the meantime, I'm going to work on my potatoes that now need draining and mashing. So I'll come back in a moment, mash the potatoes, and then when this is ready, I'll put it all together and it's time to put the oven on and get it cooking. All right. Okay, it's time to mash our mash. Um, I have some options for you. Um, you could use some horseradish. Horseradish is very nice in your mash if you want to flavour your mash. Um, you could use some whole grain mustard. Whole, ma whole, grain. whole grain mustard will look lovely. It gives you a nice appearance as well. Um, and, or English mustard. It won't actually change the appearance that much, but it gives you a nice sharp tang when you're eating it. So if you want to make some mustard mash or some horse, horseradish, that'd be lovely. Um, if you want to keep it plain, that's absolutely fine as well. So a small uh, little nub of butter there goes in. So that's probably about 15, 10 to 15 grams and 15 ml of milk, something like that. Take your masher and just press down like this and just mash your potato. There we go. Right, leave it for a moment for the butter to melt. The butter's in that corner, so it's melting away there. And then once it's melted, mash it a bit more. Um, some people use a, a sort of a liquidizer to mash it, and that does work. But if you use a liquidizer, uh, one of those pressy things, I'll get one just to show you. Here we go. So one of these, if you use one of these machines with a little blade and a, an electric motor, it tends to make it into a bit of a paste, and that's not very good. So. I would use a masher and do it by hand rather than using one of these. So there we go. Hi, this is the penultimate stage. Uh, you can put your mash on the top now and then it needs to go in the oven for about half an hour, 40 minutes, on about 180, maybe 200 degrees, depending on your oven. So I have my mash, here it is. I put a little bit of mustard into that, you can see it's slightly yellow, and uh, no surprises, I put the baked beans in, um, I think that's brilliant, but it's up to you. So this is what you're going to do, if I just show you this part, you'll need two spoons for this bit, take yourself a lump of mash, and press it a little bit, and use the other spoon just to take it off, so I'll do a couple of those just to show you. Now. You don't want to put too much weight onto it. If you get a really big blob like this and just plop it on, all of your cottage pie mixture will move and you'll end up with a big blob of mash and you won't have enough to cover the whole top. So you just need to gingerly put a thin layer on the top like this. It will move a little bit because it's only a thick liquid. It's just a viscous liquid, but there we go, just like that. So I'm gonna keep going till I've done the whole amount.
Hello, uh, my pie has been cooking now for 20, 25 minutes. Yep, that looks pretty good. I popped it on a tray, because uh, experience tells me, yep, it has. It tends to bubble a little bit like that. And you will find that if you don't put a tray underneath, it can make a mess of your uh, oven a little bit. So I've got a nice finish on there. Uh, my uh, sort of Union Jack uh, flag has come out quite nicely, so that's very good. Um, all I would say to you is to have a nice fee day with the family at home. If you manage to cook a pie like this, then brilliant. Um, I hope you really enjoyed following along the video at home with me. Uh, there's plenty more recipes that you can have a look at if you don't fancy making a pie. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Hello. So I have my rationing book here. Now the original rationing book would have been a lot smaller, but I've made this nice and big so that you can see. So inside your book, uh, if you lived in the 1940s, you would have had many things that were rationed. So that means if you went to the shop, you couldn't buy as much as you wanted. You actually had to have some coupons that the shopkeeper would take and exchange for those things, such as sugar, fats, uh, anything that's deemed a little bit uh, unnecessary, if you like. So things you take for granted today, you would have struggled to have found. So I'll just read a few bits from me from the sheet. So rationing was introduced in the 1940s and it lasted for 14 years. So that's a very long time. Most of the time, meat, cheese, butter, fats and sugar were heavily restricted. So rationing did last for longer than most people think. And actually, I uh, used to work with a chap who told me a quick story, so I'm gonna share it with you. So when he was a little boy, his uh, brother came home one day with a banana and they didn't know what to do with it. They'd never seen a banana before because they grew up just at the end of the war and actually rationing was still in effect for quite some time when they were little. So they decided to eat the banana. So what did they do? They peeled open the banana. So I'm just gonna peel open the banana here. And they looked at it and they thought, oh, this is funny. I don't know what to do with this. So what do you think they did? Any ideas? Well, they took the middle out and they threw it away because they thought that was the bad bit and they ate the peel and they didn't think it was very nice. True story, but if you grew up in a time of rationing and you couldn't get exotic fruits and things like that, then you would have struggled to understand what to do with banana. So there you go, I thought I'd share that with you. Right, so this week you will find some recipes, uh, extra recipes that you can choose from. So I have chocolate cake here, uh, unsurprisingly, chocolate was a little bit hard to get hold of during the, uh, the war and certainly afterwards. And certain things, as I've mentioned, like sugar. So follow the recipe if you would like to have a go at making this chocolate cake. This is a, a genuine World War II recipe. It's from a BBC website called Hands On History. There's mock apricot flan with carrots. Um, so they've used carrots here um, instead of apricots and it, it, it's interesting. So have a look at that one if you fancy making that. On the uh, National Trust website, if you am a National Trust person, uh, there's a wartime carrots cake, which is delightful. So go onto the website and you'll see instructions. All of these, are po uh, I'll put links in the, in the description for you. And the last one is the 1940s experiment. So it's a, it's a nice website with about 190 recipes. So there's a, there's a big old list. I've only printed some just to show you, so I don't know if you can see, but things like uh, wartime dripping, meat gravy, bread pudding, wartime Scotch shortbread, all sorts of things on this recipe. So plenty there to have a go at. So if you don't fancy doing this, this week's cook, have a go at a wartime recipe. I think you'll find it really interesting. And as I say, things were very different in, the, in those times. So it's, it's fun to try a recipe and see what it would have been like. Anyway, uh, happy for you day and I hope you enjoy the cooking. Okay, bye for now.